Hello, everybody. Welcome to Comic-Con. Now, this isn't the Comic-Con that I'm used to, uh, but we'll, we'll make do. So uh, I am Mark Rosewater, head designer for Magic the Gathering. And I am excited to do the Magic panel. So it's, it's, it's just me, but uh, I'll, I'll make up with extra excitement. So, okay. So today, for the very first time, we get to talk about Zendikar Rising, the, uh, the September set that's coming soon. Okay, so... Um, before we get to the set, I want to give a little setup. I, I want to talk a little bit about how Zendikar got made. So, sort of the, uh, the, the, the behind, the behind the scenes story of Zendikar. Okay, so, uh, go back many years ago. Uh, so 2003, uh, I become the head designer. Um, and my boss at the time was a man named Randy Bueller. Um, and he came to me and he said what he wanted me to do was to put together a five year plan. So the idea was I would put, I'd say this year we do this block and we, and they had this theme and then this block and this theme and I would lay everything out. Nowadays, by the way, there's a whole committee I'm involved, but there's a lot more people involved. Uh, back in the day, I would, I would say, oh, well, let's go do this. Um, so Randy had wanted me to make a five-year plan. And so uh, I, I actually, so I had come up, one of the things that I'd done back in the day was I would find, in order to find cool block themes, I would just find mechanics that I liked or find themes that I liked. And the idea was I wanted every block to have some mechanical theme to it. Uh, and I, there were themes that we knew worked, you know, multicolor artifacts or things that we had done before, but I really wanted to find some new space. Um, and one of the areas that I really felt had potential was land mechanics. Um, while we, we, it's something we hadn't done a lot with, but I really felt it was cool. Um, and by land mechanics, it could be mechanics that cared about lands or they're on lands or things that were land centric. Um, so when I made my five year plan, one of the worlds that I made was, uh, this land matters world. I, I think my code name at the time was called Lanzapalooza. Um, and I pitched, I actually pitched more than five ideas, um, because I, I had some extra ideas. Um, so what happened was Randy was like, well, I'm not so sure about this idea. How about we do this? We'll, we'll do these five and it'll be the sixth one. So in the five year plan, it'll be the, the extra one. Um, and the idea was, I mean, I explained to Randy and I got Randy on board on, look, yeah, we have to do things we know work, but we have to try things we don't know work because how are we going to find new exciting things? Um, but every time I talked about this set with anybody, like nobody, nobody really understood my passion for it. Everybody's kind of like, ah, I, isn't there other things you could do? What else, what else you got? Um, I remember, uh, Matt Place, which is one of the developers, I used to say, you know, I want a set where land matters. And he goes, oh, unlike all other sets where land doesn't matter. Uh, and anyway, I had passion for the idea. Randy saw I had passion for it. So eventually we got to that six year. Uh, you know, it was on the schedule of the sixth year. We eventually got to the sixth year because time advanced. Um, and so Randy goes, okay, I, we put it on the schedule. Um, so Bill sat me down. Bill Rose, who was our VP. Uh, he was the VP at the time, still the VP today. Uh, sat me down and Bill said to me, he goes, Mark, I'm not so sure about this idea. I see you have passion for it. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give you three months. And at the end of three months, bring it back to me. We'll look at it. If we think it's it's good, you really found something, we'll, we'll go ahead with it. But if it, if it hasn't quite gelled, we're going to switch to something else. Um, so I had this three-month clock on me. I knew that I had, a, I had to prove it. So I put together a design team, and we just went to town on land mechanics. We just designed, 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 designed. I think we made like 40, 50 mechanics. Um, and from this, we found Landfall. Um, and landfall was really, uh, I mean, we found other things as well. Uh, you know, there were lands that had abilities when they entered and stuff. I mean, there, there were other things that we did. Um, but landfall was really, the, was the, 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 it was kind of the thing that really showed what land could be. It was the mechanic that really, it was just so lovable so fast. Um, and so I sat down with Bill at the three months and I showed him landfall and, and all the other stuff we had done. Uh, and there was a smile on his face. Uh, and Bill said to me, he goes, okay, you did it. You can continue on with this. Uh, and so we went on. So uh, Doug Beyer, who was on the design team, who was also on the creative team, um, he came up with this cool idea of adventure world. Um, now there were a lot of different ideas. I I was pitching um, I was pitching uh, crazy weather worlds. I was pitching because one of the things about um, a land set is you just have more lands than normal. So you get to show the lands a lot. So one of the things you want to pick a world where you get dynamic lands. 
Um, so the idea that Doug came up with was what if this was Adventure World? You know, what if this was a place where, you know, it was, it was a dangerous place where the land was beautiful and there was a lot of sort of inherent things you would want there, but it was dangerous. Um, and we play into a lot of those adventure tropes. Uh, and so it was a really cool idea. We latched onto it. And then, so we started building to match that. Like one of the cool things about design and creative is design has ideas, creative has ideas, and we keep moving toward each other to get to some point where we're, we're matching so that, you know, each one of us is making changes to advance for the other. And I really felt the end version of Zendikar was, it just came up beautifully. Um, and, and a lot of people who had shown a lot of uh, doubt uh, once the set came up, then came to me and said, oh, this is a lot of fun. Um, and I remember a new, number of years later, um, we were planning the future and stuff. And Bill came to me and said, so uh, when do you think we can go back to Zendikar? And I was like, wait, what did you, what did you say, Bill? What, re return to Zendikar? So, um, so anyway, original Zendikar uh, had Zendikar, World Wake, and Rise of the Eldrazi. So the first two sets were kind of what I like to call an adventure world. Like just we learned we we had to, we went to Zendikar. There you know there was weird things going on in Zendikar. There were hedrons floating in the sky. You know there was there was stuff going on, but we didn't that that's just Zendikar, right? The, 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 the world of Zendikar itself is kind of kind of a foe to anybody who lives on it. Um, and then. Uh, we had wanted to do a third set where we radically changed things. We, we wanted to have a large set that was mechanically different, with different mechanics. So we needed a large event. Uh, and the creative team came up with this really cool idea of the Eldrazi, which were these foreign creatures that came from somewhere else that invaded the plane and were starting to kind of eat the plane. Um, and to save the multiverse, three planeswalkers, um, Ugin, Sorin, and Ahiri, um, locked them away in Zendikar so that they, they couldn't damage the multiverse. And they've been trapped for a long, long time. And it was one of the reasons the world was reacting the way it was. Uh, and then a bunch of planeswalkers, uh, not really on purpose, kind of released the Eldrazi. So the final step Rise of Eldrazi was, <gasps> the Eldrazi have gotten out. Uh, it's kind of a cliffhanger, by the way. It's like, hey, we're on Zendikar, things are good. And then the block ends with, and the Eldrazi are out. See you later. Um, so... Years later, we knew we wanted to come back, and we had left a cliffhanger, right? So when we came back, it was Battle for Zendikar uh, and Oath of the Gatewatch, where um, the, the, all the people, all the, all the creatures, the denizens of Zendikar had to band together to fight against the Eldrazi, who were, were destroying the world. Um, and so there was a big fight. It was it was a little bit different. It, it was a, it was it was Zendikar. It, it had a lot of mechanics. Of Zendikar, you know, it had land stuff and such. But it wasn't. Um, it had a little bit of a different feel. Um, it was where the Gatewatch got formed. Oath of the Gatewatch was literally the forming of the Gatewatch. The first four members of the Gatewatch took an oath, um, and they defeated the Eldrazi. At least two of them. Uh, one of them skittered off to Innistrad, but that's a different story. Um, but anyway, they defeated them. The Eldrazi were gone. Um, so for Zendikar Rising, one of the things that we really wanted was it, it was a return to what like I like to call Adventure World Zendikar. A lot of people really fell in love with Zendikar when it first got premiered. And when we came back last time, I mean, yeah, it was Zendikar, but it wasn't kind of the Zendikar that a lot of people had fallen in love with. So one of our main goals when we were designing the set is, okay, we want to go back to Zendikar, but we want to recapture original Zendikar. Adventure World Zendikar, as I like to call it. And that was the main goal. That was something that we were very, it was very careful for us to try to do that. Um, okay, so now let me say this. I'm going to tease a little bit about some stuff in, in, uh, in Zendikar Rising. Uh, I, I'm not giving away mechanics. I'm not showing cards. It's a little early for that. Um, but I do have some stuff to teach you. I, 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 I told them I was doing my panel, so they said that I, 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 I negotiated some things that I could say. So I want to talk a little bit about what can you expect in Zendikar Rising. Okay, first up, Zendikar Rising is a land set. It is, that's what Zendikar is. Um, and it's very cool. And so there are a lot of cool lands. I can't tell you about all of them, uh, but there are a lot of cool lands. But I can't tell you about two things. One is full art basics return. Uh, it's a staple of Zendikar. Every Zendikar has had them and they're back and they're beautiful. Um, and the second thing is um, many years ago, all my stories start with many years ago, um, I made six dual lands that I was very proud of, that I thought were really cool. Um, and I've been trying to get them into a set. And finally, I'm happy to say that in Zendikar Rising, my six dual lands finally find a home. And I think you guys will really like them. Okay, also, 
Uh, there's a brand new mechanic in the set that takes a really popular theme that I know players like, and it, it, it twists it in a new way. It's sort of, what we did is we brought it to Zendikar and it's kind of made it more of a Zendikar. We, we did, we, we Zendikar'd it up. Um, and it, it's, it's really fun, but it's different. And like I said, it's, it's a theme you've seen before, but worked in a way that, that you haven't seen before. So it, it's kind of a mix of new and old that I think you guys will enjoy. Um, also, there are two returning mechanics, both of which have previously appeared in a Zendikar set. Um, also, a bunch of legendary creatures you love from Zendikar will be back, including one that does get another color. Uh, and finally, um, there will be three planeswalkers, all of which we know. Um, all of which have had, a, all of them have had at least three previous planeswalker cards. Um, so there's no new planeswalkers. Uh, we're telling a fun story, but it's with characters you know, and in, in characters you know, you know pretty well. Like I said, they they have three planeswalker cards in them. Um, finally, actually, I said finally for the last thing, but this is the real finally. Uh, I have a lot of cool things to tell you, but I also have some cool things to show you. Um, so one of the coolest things uh, about, about today is I get to show you a bunch of Zendikar art. Now, I can't show you the full cards, but the art is really beautiful. So let's take a look. Okay, I hope you guys enjoyed the art. Uh, some cool stuff. Uh, that's sort of a little, a little, a little taste of what's to come for Zendikar Rising. Okay, next, next, when Zendikar Rising comes out, we got a brand new product, and I can tell you all about it. Okay, so it's a new kind of booster, what we're calling a set booster. Okay, but before I begin, before I even talk about the set booster, I, I want to say this: uh, this is something additive to the game. What I mean by that is we are not changing anything that that exists. Draft boosters, theme boosters, collection boosters. If that's your thing, if that's how you enjoy magic, if when I, when I talk about set boosters, it's not for you, you can just keep doing that. We're not, you know, this is something that is for the people who want it and the people that don't want it. If you just want to keep drafting and love the draft boosters, get draft boosters. Okay, now before I explain what a set booster is, I want to go a little bit into the mindset of how we got there. So one of the things we've been doing a lot of thinking about in the last couple of years is thinking of our product line a little differently. Um, a lot of times that we, we, we spend a lot of time understanding our audience and a lot of times we make products and you know, products can, we, we say, hey audiences, find what you like in the product we make. Um, but over the last you know, five or so years, we've started doing more and more designing products that match the player. Um, like Commander is a perfect example where we, we found that this, this uh, a lot of people that like Commander, we started gearing toward it, making more products for that Commander audience. Um, but one of the things that made us ask is, can we go farther with this? You know, can we take things that we assume as a given and question, is there a way to make that better? So a perfect example is the booster pack, okay? Uh, Magic's booster pack, I mean, if you go back in time, for many, many years, there was one booster pack, what we now call the draft booster. That was your entry to Magic. If you wanted to play Magic, you were going through the draft booster. Um, and a lot of players don't draft. So, like, one of the problems of having a singular booster is um, the restrictions you make for one group apply for all groups, even if they, that group doesn't care about that. For example, when making a draft booster, you have to make a draft well. You have to have certain rarities in it. You have to have certain color balance in it. There's power balance. There's all sorts of stuff we do to make a draft booster draft well. Well, if you're not a drafter, if you don't care about drafting, that means that your pack is kind of making choices for something you don't care about. Um, so that led us to ask the question, could we make a booster that's not a draft booster, that's for a different audience? So the first booster we made was a theme booster. So a theme booster, the idea was, okay, this is, it's a little bit bigger, it has a theme to it, maybe mechanical, maybe flavorful, maybe both. 
Um, usually it's one color, maybe two. And it, the idea of it is it lets people go, ooh, I'm interested in this theme. And then they can take a whole bunch of cards from it and add it to their deck or build a new deck around that. But it, it gives them people who really want to dive into that. Um, it just allowed them to do that. And it, they it proved to be very popular. And it was a different audience that wanted a different thing. Um, next, we made collector boosters. Um, we've always had, or not always, but for a long time, we've, we've had our foil cards. Um, starting with Throne Eldraine, we started uh, what we call booster fun, uh, showcase cards, um, uh, borderless planeswalkers, extended art. There's a lot of cool things we're doing um, with our cards. Uh, in Akori, for example, we did the promotion uh, with Godzilla. There's all sorts of things we're doing. And that the, the collectors really want to collect the cards. And a draft booster what, didn't make it very easy. So we said, okay, can we make a booster that made it easier to collect the hard-to-get cards? And so we made a booster for the collectors. Um, very popular with the collectors. So um, what we found is we were able to make different boosters for different audiences. So we had the draft booster, we had the theme booster, we had the collector booster. We're like, okay, three boosters, that's a lot of boosters, we're, we're, we're done. But then we got a piece of data, which, which changed everything. Uh, so what we learned is over half of the booster packs that are opened are not used for any purpose. I mean, are not used in limited, you know, they're not used in sealed, they're not used in draft. They're just opened and they put them in, in their collection that there's no other use for the cards beyond just playing with them for magic within their collection. Um, and we realized there was a golden opportunity here. Um, that there's a whole bunch of people, like I said, the majority of booster packs, um, there's a whole bunch of people that we could make a better experience for. That what if we made a booster pack that was the most fun booster pack to open? What if we made a booster pack that maximized the opening experience. Um, now, to do that, we had a couple tools. One was, um, we it was its own pack. It didn't have to follow the rules of any of the other packs. Draft rules have all, draft packs have all sorts of rules uh, that you need to make them work for draft. You know, how many cards you have to have. Like, you have to have 15 cards and certain color, I mean, you know, the color mix. And anyway, none of that. The, the set booster didn't have to worry about any of that. Um, uh, and so, it really had the freedom to be what it wanted to be. So what we did is, we exp to explore this idea, we, we took the draft booster and said, okay, why is opening a draft booster fun? I mean, it is fun. Um, the goal here is to make opening more fun. It, it's not that opening booster isn't fun. We're just trying to make it more fun. Um, and what we found was, finding new cards is always exciting, but that's true of, of, of any, any booster that has new cards. Um, the real sort of, uh, if you ask people the most exciting thing of a draft booster, most people would say, the rare mythic rare slot. That's exciting. What did I get? You know, uh, and it made what we called an excitement point, meaning it made a point in the booster pack where you just were very excited because you wanted to see what happened. So one of the things we said to ourselves is, oh, is there a way to build more excitement points into the, the opening of the booster? That draft boosters have one excitement point. What if we made a draft booster with many excitement points? Uh, and that was the thing that drew us. So um, I'm going to right now walk you through. So one of the things we did to kind of make the draft, uh, not draft, the set booster, uh, an exciting thing is we made it kind of little journeys you go through, that there are slots in the booster pack, uh, and then we divided the slots into four chapters. Um, before I get to that, though, um, I just want to say we didn't have to follow the rules of a draft booster, so we didn't. So a draft booster has 16 cards in it, 15 of which are magic cards, one of which is a magic aid. Um, in uh, set boosters, we will have 14 cards, 12 of which are magic cards, and two of which are magic-related cards. Um, and so, uh, this is, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to walk, I'm going to give you a little tour through the set booster, from the slot one to slot 14. Um, and then, like I said, we divided them into chapters, what we call the welcome chapter, the fireworks chapter, uh, the big finish chapter, and the epilogue chapter. And for each, as I walk through, I'll explain the chapters and I'll explain each slot. And as you will see, we've built excitement in along the way. Uh, the idea is you're not just waiting for one card. There's many, many opportunities where there's, there's a chance for excitement. Okay, so let, let's walk through it. Okay, slot one is the art card slot. So in um, Modern Horizons, we made, for the very first time, we made art cards. There were 54 of them. Uh, and they had... The art on the front, we picked 
cards where people like the art. It, the art is blown up all the way to the edge. Just gorgeous art. Uh, and then on the back is a little bit of information like who the artist and stuff. Um, and we put those in the packs and we found an audience that really enjoyed them. Uh, and we think that that audience overlaps a lot with who we think will enjoy the set boosters. And so we decided to put art cards. Uh, we're bringing art cards back. They're going to be in the set boosters. So the first slot is an art card. Um, there were 54 in Modern Horizons. We have 81 in Zendikar Risings in the set boosters. We wanted to bring excitement. So every slot, we wanted to bring excitement. So starting with the very first slot, we said, okay, how do we bring excitement to this slot? So the way we did that is 5% of the time, 1 in 20, instead of a normal art card, you get a special signature version. And those versions have the signature of the artist embossed in gold on the card. Uh, and every art card, all 81, exists both in the normal version and in their signature version. Okay, moving on to slot two. This is the land slot. Um, we wanted to show off, the, so, so part of the welcome chapter uh, was we wanted to welcome you to the booster pack, to the world, and lands do a really good job of showing off the world. And so uh, the default for this booster pack will be uh, the basic land, but from set to set, if there's other things we want to do, just like sometimes we swap out the basic land for other things in the draft booster, we might do that in, in this slot. Um, now, the lands, the basic lands in uh, Zendikar Rising are full art and beautiful. Uh, so that's what you get in this slot. You get the full art lands. Um, now, as I said, every slot, there's the opportunity for excitement. So the opportunity here is 15% uh, of the time, instead of a normal land, a normal full art basic land uh, for Zendikar Rising, you will get a foil version of the card. Now, I want to say there is other possibilities for foil later in the pack. So if you get a foil here, that doesn't change that. You, you actually can get two foils in a set booster pack. Okay, um, on to slot three. Slot three, four, five, six, seven, and eight are the co connected commons and uncommons. Uh, so these are the guaranteed sort of normal commons and uncommons in your booster. Um, there are other slots that can give you commons or uncommons, uh, but these are the ones you're guaranteed every time. Um, and what we did is we didn't have to follow the draft booster. We didn't have to worry about color balance or anything. So what we did is we found interesting connections between the commons and between the uncommons. So the idea was the connection might be they play well together. The connection might be they use a similar mechanic. The connection might be they're the same creature type. The connection might be there's some flavorful that the, they're both connected to a planeswalker or something. Um, the idea is that when you open these up, one of the things you get to explore is you get to see why and how they're connected. Um, now, these are six cards. Oh, and, and like I said, always room for excitement. So in these six cards, you're guaranteed getting five commons and you always get one uncommon. But in these slots, every common can upgrade to an uncommon. So you could get five commons and one uncommon, or you could get as much as six uncommons and no commons. Um, so that's excitement here is you get the connected cards, but you always have the chance of upgrading uh, and getting more uncommons. Okay, so now we move into the next chapter, the fireworks chapter. So this is splashy, but a little bit of a surprise. You don't quite know always what you're getting. Okay, so slot number nine is the head turner slot. Uh, and so uh, this is a card that looks different from a normal magic card. Um, in Zendikar Rising, it is either, and this slot is always a common or uncommon. Um, uh, in Zendikar Rising, it'll either be a showcase card or there's a cool new thing we're doing in the set uh, that I can't talk about, but it's either um, a showcase card or, or this, this cool thing and always a common or uncommon. Okay, um, slot number 10 and 11 are the wild card rarity slots. So what the wild card rarity slots are is, it's a slot that could be any rarity. It could be common, it could be uncommon, it could be rare, it could be mythic rare. And these slots don't count against, you have a guaranteed slot coming that's your rare mythic rare slot. If you get a rare mythic rare here, maybe two, uh, that's just bonus for the pack, that's just extra for the pack. Uh, so you have the opportunity to get more, more rares and mythic rares in these slots. Okay. Next, we move into the Big Finish chapter. So the Big Finish chapter is about a little more guaranteed. The fireworks was, was a little more random. This is something that's a little bit more guaranteed. So the next slot, slot number 12, is your rare Mythic Rare slot. 
That was the most exciting thing in the draft booster. We couldn't lose that. So this is a slight, you know for sure you're getting a rare Mythic Rare. So every set booster will have at least one rare Mythic Rare. No matter what happens in other slots, you always have that. Um, slot number 13 is the foil card slot. You are guaranteed a foil card. Now, that foil card could be common, uncommon, rare, or mythic rare. So yes, this is another slot where you could get a rare or mythic rare. And if you do, there'll be foil. Um, so uh, as I said before, uh, you have four opportunities. You have the two wild card rarity slots. You have your guaranteed rare slot and you have the foil card slot. Any of which could be, one of which is guaranteed, but any of which could be a rare or mythic rare. So it is possible, I'm not saying it happens a lot, but it is possible, for example, to open a set booster and get four mythic rares. That is a possibility. Okay, so finally we move on to the fourth and final chapter, the epilogue. Uh, we're saying goodbye. Uh, so that is slot number 14, the final slot, which is an add or token card. Uh, it's much like the add or token card you would get in um, a draft booster, for example. But we like having surprises. So there's a big surprise with this final slot. So 25% of the time, one in four, instead of getting an ad slash token card, you will get a card from the list. So you're asking, Mark, what is the list? Uh, so Time Spiral and Mystery Booster have shown us that the audience really likes digging into the past of magic. Uh, right now we have 27 years of magic. And so... What the list is, is we've uh, made a list of 300 cards from Magic's past. And what we've done is we're, we're, they're straight pickups. What that means is they look like they looked wherever we got them from. They're in the frame they were before, the expansion symbol, everything about them is just as they looked. The only difference uh, is we put a Planeswalker symbol in the lower left corner, um, kind of like um, the Mythic, uh, the Mystery Booster cards did. Um, so anyway... Uh, this is a list of 300 cards. There's commons, there's uncommons, there's uh, rares, there's mythic rares. Um, exciting stuff. And um, in fact, I was allowed to show you three cards from the list. So um, let me show you those three cards. Okay, so first up is Muscle Sliver from Tempest. My baby, my, my first set. Um, so the reason we wanted to show you Muscle Sliver is to say that there are a lot of fun mechanical things from Magic's past. So we definitely want to honor that. So there's a lot of cool cards that are showing all the cool mechanics that Magic once did once upon a time. Um, next up is Cloud Goat Ranger. Um, so we picked this card to show you to represent the idea that we're going to show off a lot of the cool uh, flavor and worlds of Magic's past. So this, this card is from, from Lorwyn, which is had a little bit of a different style from a lot of other worlds. So one of the things the list will do is we get to show off a lot of the cool creative that Magic has had. Um, the final card I'll show you today is Pact of Negation. Uh, and this is a show, lots of surprises can happen. Uh, cards that counter cards when you have no mana up. Um, and so really we want the set to be something that can really sort of shock and surprise people. Um, so it'll be, now by the way, it's going to be 300 cards. Um, it's going to subtly change from set to set, meaning... Some cards will change, but the vast majority will stay the same. So over time, it'll change over time, but you'll get to learn what the list is. And so, um, and like I said, it's, it's a pretty big list. It's 300 cards. So it'll be something exciting for you at the end of the booster pack. Okay, so now that I've walked you all the way through the set booster, I just want to talk about a few other things uh, before we wrap up. Okay, number one, um, the set booster is going to be a little bit more expensive than the draft booster. Um, but if you, if, let's say you have a certain amount of money to spend and you spend it on set boosters or spend it on, um, uh, draft boosters, you will end get, you will end up getting the same amount of rares and mythic rares. And the reason for that is a draft booster, you're going to get one, uh, um, a set booster, you're guaranteed one, but you can get two, you can get three, you can get four, you can get up to four rares or mythic rares inside a set booster. And that's not counting the list, by the way. Um, and so... You know, there's just opportunity to get more of them. So it's balanced between them. If you buy, like I said, you spend the same amount of money, you will get the same amount of rares and mythic rares. Uh, the other thing is uh, the uh, the box for uh, set boosters is a little bit different. Uh, it's got 30 cards, 30 packs in it uh, uh, instead of the normal. So it is, it's a little bit different. Anyway, um, hopefully with me walking through this, uh, I think the set booster is a really cool thing. It's a different experience. 
If you're somebody who is just opening your packs and not doing anything else with them, you're not drafting or something, maybe you want to give this a try. Um, like I said, it, it, it really gives you an opportunity at, at many different levels. There's just many different excitement points. You know, am I getting a signature art card? Am I getting a foil land? Are my commons going, you know, upgrading to uncommons? You know, uh, at every step along the way, what, what rarity card am I getting? What foil am I getting? Um, there's just lots of, like, all through the pack that we realized that we, we wanted to really make something that was dramatic and fun. And we, we think we have. So, um, I'm excited for you. Uh, for, if this sounds exciting to you, uh, please give them a try when they come out with Zendikar Rising. Oh, now that I'm done with the presentations, it's time for the Q&A. Okay, first question, uh, Chandra. Okay, uh, can everybody hear her? Uh, okay, I'll, I'll repeat the question. Um, Chandra said she doesn't like the Eldrazi. Uh, are there going to be any Eldrazi in um, in Zendikar Rising? Uh, the answer is no. Um, the Eldrazi are gone, thanks to you guys. Um, and uh, but 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 the world still suffers from the Eldrazi having been there. Meaning we will see the ramifications of the Eldrazi having been there, even though they're not currently there. So the Eldrazi still have some influence in the world, but no, 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 the, the Eldrazi are gone. Okay, next question, uh, Jace. Okay, so Jace is asking. Um, he said that he gave some percentages on some of the slots, uh, like the art slot and the land slot and such. Uh, what will, could I get percentages for the other slots? Stuff like the common uncommon slots or the wild card slots. Um, so my answer to that is I wrote an article uh, that's going to go up shortly after uh, this talk. And that gives more information about set boosters, and it will include things like uh, the percentages on some of the slots I didn't talk about. Okay. Uh, oh, I'm being told this is our final question. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, I guess, Bolas, I, I guess you get the final question. Okay. So the question is, do we have plans in a future expansion to set it in the meditation realm? Uh, well, I, I, uh, I don't talk about the future, uh, and I, I never say never. Um, but I will admit that that is unlikely for uh, a future set. Uh, okay. Well, anyway, that is all the questions. Um, so I want to thank everybody for joining me here. Um, this has been a lot of fun and uh, a very different San Diego Comic-Con experience. Uh, I'm hoping next year uh, I'll see you guys not from my couch. Uh, but anyway, uh, it's been a blast. So I'm Mark Rosewater. Thank you so much for joining me, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.